So we didn't, when we talked about the strength of rock, we didn't really talk about um, rock strength and isotropy. But of course, rocks are bedding planes. You can just look at a rock and probably understand that it's going to be an anisotropic material, meaning it's going to have different failure modes depending on how you low it, load it with respect to the bedding planes. Or in the case of sort of a large volume of rock where there's lots of fractures, then how you load it with respect to those fractures or flaws are going to make a big difference. And so you can actually think of it possibly like the rock has two strengths. You know, it has one strength that you'll call like the intact strength. So if you have, um, you know, this drawing has a bunch of little flaws in it. Well, if you, if you were to load this rock perfectly normal to those flaws, right, you're not going to cause any of those to slip, right? If they're all oriented in, in sort of one direction, and you load perpendicular to that, apply a force perpendicular to that, none of those things are going to slip no matter how high the force is. And so that strength would be what you'd call the intact strength of the rock. And you, if you fit, you know, if you did a several tests loading the rock in that direction and you fit a line, you know, uh, more Coulomb, linearized more Coulomb model to it, then you'd, you know, say that the rock has one strength. Of course, if you load, remember we talked about there's a, there's a preferential there's a preferential angle at which we can load respect to any fractures or flaws in the rock, which will uh, maximize the potential to slip. Right? And so if we load the rock in that way, in a direction that's sort of perfect, at a perfect maximal to their preference to slip, and if you remember, for a, for a value of mu of 0.6, that was like 60 degrees. Right? For internal friction angle of the rock to be 0.6, that was like 60 degrees. So if we if we load roughly 60 degrees to those flaws, and then the rock's going to be appear to be much much weaker. Okay, and so then you'd have this the second sort of strength of the rock, which is characterized by a cohesion uh, S W, the weaker cohesion. In a different internal friction angle, and again, these these more circles come from you know performing material tests with these at those values, right? So remember how you do these, right? You go to the lab and you control, you do a triaxial test, so you control the minimum maximum principal stresses, and you do this for a very you know varying the minimum maximum principal stresses. You draw multiple more circles, and you fit the best line to them, right? So anyway, if you do that, uh, you can, in Zobac, they did do it in the book, they can derive this expression where the maximum strength is a function of the minimum strength times, uh, you know, this, this factor here sort of reduces the strength, right, uh, where these are the weakened values. Right? And so then over here on this side, you can see that, you know, if you're loading at an angle, uh, that sort of has the, where the rock has a preference to slip. So in this region of like, I don't know, 40 to 80 degrees, in this region, then you're going to have an, ex you're going to expect to see a reduction in strength in some way. Okay. So we didn't really talk about that when we talked about the strength of rock. But with respect to breakouts, when you have rock strength and isotropy, it affects the way uh, that the breakouts will appear in the televiewer. So I this was right at the end of the class last time when we talked about the televiewer. But if you remember, the way you, you visualize breakouts in a televiewer window is they appear as like two dropouts, right? There were two distinct dropouts in the televiewer window. And in this case, they're kind of hard to see, but this is a, this is a televiewer window uh, looking at breakouts for rock that has significant anisotropy, and there's sort of four dropouts. So you see one here, you see one here, you see one here, you see one here. So remember, this is like the, 
this is like the wellbore is being unrolled, right? Being unrolled, and you're and you're looking at a picture of it. And those correspond, if you if you do a reconstruction, to sort of double lobed breakouts. So you end up with these sort of double lobed breakouts, and that's and that's due to the anisotropy. And another way to think about why this is occurring is, you know, you, you have your, if you, if you remember from the Sushan and Kirsch equations, you had these sort of streamlines of stress concentration in that picture. And they all kind of stack up or bunch up together along SH min, and so you get these breakouts that occur here. In the sort of normal location. So these breakouts occur where you'd expect them with respect to the far field stress. And then the other breakouts will occur associated with that preferential angle, right? The preferential angle with respect to the bedding plane would cause these secondary lobes to form due to slip of the, of the weakened bedding plane. So you'll always, uh, in, in anisotropic rocks, you'll, you'll you can expect to see these sort of double lobe breakouts like that. 